This is the lecture for part one of section 7.4, isomorphisms and homomorphisms. In the chapter on ring theory, we define two rings to be isomorphic, provided there is a bijective function which preserves the two ring operations. In this case, the two rings are essentially equivalent to one another. We can define two groups to be isomorphic in a similar way. So we'll start by defining a group homomorphism. Suppose G is a group with group operation star, and H is a group with operation dot. The function f from G to H is a homomorphism provided that it satisfies the condition, we'll call it GH, preservation of operation, for all A and B in G, f of A star B is equal to f of A dot f of B. Note that in this equality, on the left side, A and B are elements in the domain G, so star is the operation in G. On the right side, f of A and f of B are elements in the codomain H, so dot is the operation in H. Now a group G is isomorphic to a group H, which is denoted with our isomorphism symbol, the same symbol we use for rings. It's an equal sign with a tilde on top provided that there is a function f from g to h such that first f is injective, which means for all g1, g2, and g, if g1 is not equal to g2, then f of g1 is not equal to f of g2. Secondly, f is surjective. For each h and h, there exists a g and g such that f of g is equal to h. And third, f is a group homomorphism. For all g1, g2, and g, f of g1 star g2 is equal to f of g1 dot f of g2. The function f is called an isomorphism. Now, if f from g to h is an isomorphism, then it can be shown that its inverse, f inverse, from h to g is also an isomorphism. Therefore, g is isomorphic to h if and only if h is isomorphic to g. For our first example, let's let G be the, set, the group consisting of the complex numbers 1, minus 1, i, negative i, with the operation of complex number multiplication. And let Z4 be the integers mod 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, with the operation of addition modulo 4. We want to show that G is isomorphic to Z4. So to show that G is isomorphic to Z4, we need to come up with an isomorphism. And so we can define F from G to Z4 by, well, with only four elements, we can specify our mapping by just explicitly saying what each element maps to. So F of 1 maps to 0. F of negative 1 maps to 2. F of i is equal to 1. And F of negative i is equal to 3. And we want to show that f is an isomorphism. Now it's clear that f is a one-to-one -one correspondent, so each element or the elements in the two groups are paired up exactly one-to-one, -one. so it remains only to show that f is a homomorphism. And to show this, we need to show that for all a and b and g, f of a times b is equal to f of a plus f of b. Now note that the operation in the domain g is complex number multiplication, while the operation in the codomain, Z4, is uh, addition mod 4. Now we can verify this by using a proof by exhaustion. So for instance, f of negative 1 times i is equal to f of negative i. And the way we defined our function, we said f of negative i is 3, which is equal to 2 plus 1, which is equal to f of negative 1 plus f of i. So we've satisfied our homomorphism condition for these two particular elements. And we can check two more elements, f of i times negative i. This is equal to f of 1, which is equal to 0, according to how we defined f. And 0 is equal to 1 plus 3 in z4. And that's equal to f of i plus f of negative i. OK, now, in order to verify the equality using a proof by exhaustion, we'd have to go through for every pair of elements a and b and g. Alternatively, we can verify this using the operation tables. So the operation table for g is as shown. <coughs> 
Replacing each entry in the table with this image under F, we obtain the following table. And substituting the function values, we obtain this table. And this is the operation table for Z4, with the rows and columns in a different order than usual. So this shows that the group operation in G is preserved under the mapping. And therefore, F is an isomorphism, and G is isomorphic to Z4. <clears throat> We've now shown that the mapping f from g to z4, defined by f of 1 is 0, f of negative 1 is 2, f of i is 1, and f of negative i is 3, is an isomorphism. But how do we determine the function f to begin with? Well, we'll show later in this section that a homomorphism must map the identity element in its domain to the identity element in its codomain. This tells us that if we want to define an isomorphism for these two groups, we must define f of 1 to be 0. 1 is the identity element in G, and 0 is the identity element in Z4. We'll also see later that an isomorphism must preserve the orders of elements. This means that for any element A in the domain, the order of A must be equal to the order of its image, f of A. Since negative 1 is the only element of order 2 in G, and 2 is the only element of order 2 in Z4, this implies we must define f of negative 1 to be 2. Now the other two elements in G, i and negative i, both have order 4, as do the other two elements in Z4, 1 and 3. So we must define f of i to equal either 1 or 3, while f of negative i will equal the other element. Now it turns out that either of these two choices will result in an isomorphism. So carrying out all of these steps, we then have our mapping. Now note that while this reasoning tells us how to define f, we still need to verify that f is in fact an isomorphism. For our next example, let's let g be gl2r, be the group of invertible 2 by 2 real matrices with the operation of matrix multiplication. And let h be r star be the group of non-zero real numbers with the operation of real number multiplication. And we'll define g f from g to h by f of a is equal to the determinant of a for each matrix a in g. And we want to show that f is a homomorphism which is surjective but not injective. To show f as a homomorphism, we need to show for all matrices a and b and g, f of a, b is equal to f of a times f of b. So let's suppose that a equal the matrix a, b, c, d, and b is the matrix e, f, g, h, are arbitrary matrices in g. Then a, b is the product of those two matrices, and that will be the matrix shown then f of ab is equal to the determinant of ab, so that will be the determinant of that product matrix. And this is just a 2 by 2 matrix, and so the determinant is just the product of the diagonal entries minus the product of the off-diagonal entries. And if you multiply these terms out, we obtain this. Now you'll notice that four of the terms cancel. So the first two terms in each set of parentheses cancel, and the last two terms in each set of parentheses cancel. And so we're left with this expression. And I want to rearrange a few of these terms. And I also want to rearrange a few of the factors in the products. And this can be factored as AD minus BC times EH minus FG which is equal to the determinant of A times the determinant of B, which is equal to F of A times F of B. So therefore, F is a homomorphism. Next, to show that F is surjective, we need to show for all real numbers R in H, there exists a matrix A in G, such that F of A is equal to R. So we'll suppose R is an arbitrary non-zero real number, we need to show there exists an a and g such that f of a is equal to r. 
So we'll set this up using two columns. So we need to find an A, then we need to verify that A satisfies our two conditions. Our domain, A, has to belong to G, and our propositional function, F of A, has to equal R. Now, we need a two by two matrix A then with determinant R. And we can choose pretty much any matrix we like as long as it satisfies that condition. And so the easiest one maybe is uh, the matrix uh, R001. And now since the determinant of A is equal to R, which is assumed to be non-zero, then A is invertible, so A belongs to our group G. Since f of a is equal to the determinant of a is equal to r, then the propositional function holds, and therefore f is surjective. Next, we need to show that f is not injective. To show this, we need to show there exist matrices a and b and g, such that a is not equal to b, and f of a is equal to f of b. So we need to pick two matrices that are not equal to one another, whose images are the same under the function f. So we can choose, say, A is the matrix 3, 1, 0, 4, and B is the matrix 2, 0, 7, 6. Then, since A and B have non-zero determinants, then they're both invertible, so belong to G. Then A is not equal to B, but F of A is equal to the determinant of A is 12, which is equal to the determinant of B, which is equal to F of B. And therefore, F is not injective. For our next example, we'll let G be R, just the additive group of real numbers, and H will be R star star. This is the multiplicative group of positive real numbers. And we want to define F from G to H by F of R is equal to 10 to the R for each R and G. And we want to show that F is an isomorphism, and hence G is isomorphic to H. So we need to show that f is a homomorphism, f is surjective, and f is injective. To show f is a homomorphism, we need to show for all r and s and g, f of r plus s is equal to f of r times f of s. Now note the operation in g is addition, while the operation in h is multiplication. So suppose r and s are arbitrary real numbers, then f of r plus s is equal to 10 to the r plus s power, which is equal to 10 to the r times 10 to the s, which is equal to f of r times f of s. So f is a homomorphism. Next, to show f is surjective, we need to show for all h and h, our codomain, there exists an r in g, our domain, such that f of r is equal to h. So we'll suppose h is an arbitrary positive real number, and we need to show there exists an r and g such that f of r is equal to h. So we'll go ahead and set this up using two columns again. So we need to find an r and then verify that r satisfies first our domain, r must belong to g, and our propositional function, f of r, is equal to h. So r must satisfy the condition f of r equal 10 to the r equal h, so we can choose r to be the log base 10 of h. And now since h is an h, then h is a positive real number, so the log base 10 of h is defined, and r equal log base 10 of h is an element of g, the set of real numbers. The propositional function holds since f of r, which is 10 to the r, will be 10 to the log base 10 of h, and that's equal to h, and therefore f is surjective. To show f is injective, we need to show for all r and s and g, f of r equal f of s implies r equals s. So suppose r and s are arbitrary real numbers. Suppose f of r is equal to f of s, then 10 to the r is equal to 10 to the s, and taking the base 10 logarithms of both sides, we obtain r is equal to s. And therefore, f is injective. So thus, f is an isomorphism, so g is isomorphic to h. The next theorem collects some basic properties of homomorphisms. 
Now recall that for any function f from g to h, the subset of h containing the images of all elements of g is called the image of f. So the image of f is the set of h and h such that there exists an element a and g such that h is equal to f of a. And we can represent this pictorially. So we've got our domain represented by the oval on the left and our codomain h represented by the oval on the right. And f is mapping elements of our domain into elements in our codomain. And the image is the set of all elements in our codomain that are images of elements of, from our domain. And now the function f can be considered as a surjective map from g to the image of f. So theorem 720 says, let g and h be groups with identity elements e sub g and e sub h respectively. Suppose f from g to h is a homomorphism. Then first, f maps the identity element in g into the identity element in h. So f of e sub g is equal to e sub h. And this is that fact that I had mentioned earlier when we were looking at the very first example in this section. Second, for each element a and g, f of a inverse is equal to the inverse of f of a. So that means that f maps inverse elements into inverse elements. And then third, the image of f is a subgroup of h. And fourth, if f is injective, then g is isomorphic to the image of f. So we'll start by proving 1, f of e sub g is equal to e sub h. And note that since e sub g is the identity element in g, then e sub g will be equal to e sub g times e sub g. And since f is a homomorphism, then f of e sub g equals f of e sub g times e sub g will be equal to f of e sub g times f of e sub g. Now since e sub h is the identity element in h, then f of e sub g is equal to e sub h times f of e sub g. So on the one hand, we have f of e sub g is equal to f of e sub g times f of e sub g. And on the other, we have f of e sub g is e sub h times f of e sub g. So we can set these two expressions equal to one another. And then we can cancel, by theorem 7.5, we can cancel f of e sub g on the right to obtain f of e sub g equals e sub h. And this proves part one of the theorem. Next up, for part two, we want to show for each element a and g, f of a inverse is equal to the inverse of f of a. So suppose a is an arbitrary element of g, and we need to prove this equality. And to show this, we need to show that f of a inverse is the inverse element of f of a. And to show this, we need to show that f of a times f of a inverse will be equal to the identity element in h. Now the left side is f of a times f of a inverse. And since f is a homomorphism, this is f of a times a inverse, which is f of e sub g, which we just got done showing in part 1 is equal to e sub h. And since inverses are unique, this shows that since f of a inverse behaves like the inverse element for f of a, then it must equal the inverse element to f of a. So this proves part two of the theorem. Next, for part three, we want to show that the image of f, which again is the set of h and h, such that there exists an element a and g, such that h is equal to f of a, is a subgroup of h. And to show this, we need to show that the image of f satisfies our three conditions for a subgroup, sg0, sg1, and sg2. So for sg0, we need to show that the image of f is non-empty. And by part one of the theorem, we've shown that f of e sub g is equal to e sub h, which implies that e sub h belongs to the image of f. So if we look at the element e sub h in h, there exists an element in g, namely e sub g, that maps into it. Therefore, the image of f is non-empty, so satisfies sg0. For sg1 closure, we need to show for all h and k in the image of f, 
h times k is in the image of f. So suppose h and k are arbitrary elements of the image of f. We need to show their product hk is in the image of f. To show this, we need to show that there exists an element c in g such that hk is equal to f of c. So this is the condition for an element to belong to the image of f. There must exist an element in g that maps into it. Now since h and k belong to the image of f, then there exists elements a and b in g such that h is equal to f of a and k is equal to f of b. So a maps into h and b maps into k. So we want to choose c to be the product of a and b. Then c belongs to g and hk is f of a times f of b which is equal to f of a b since f is a homomorphism which is equal to f of c as required. And therefore h times k belongs to the image of f so the image of f satisfies our condition SG1. And then we've got SG2, containment of inverses. We need to show for all h in the image of f, h inverse belongs to the image of f. So suppose h is an arbitrary element of the image of f. We need to show h inverse belongs to the image of f. And to show this, we need to show that there exists an element c in g such that h inverse is equal to f of c. Now since h belongs to the image of f, then there exists an element a in g such that h is equal to f of a. And we'll choose c to be a inverse. Then c belongs to g, and by part two of the theorem, h inverse will be f of a inverse, which is equal to f of a inverse, which is equal to f of c, as required. And therefore h inverse belongs to the image of f, so the image of f satisfies our condition SG2. So that verifies our three conditions, and thus the image of f is a subgroup. And this proves part three of the theorem. And next we have part four. If f is injective, then g is isomorphic to the image of f. So suppose f is injective, and we need to show that g is isomorphic to the image of f. Now it follows from the definition of the image of f that restricting the codomain of f to the image of f, the resulting function f from g to the image of f is surjective. And since f is also injective by our hypothesis and is a homomorphism, then f from g to the image of f will be an isomorphism, and hence g is isomorphic to the image of f. And this proves part four of the theorem, so completes the proof of the theorem. And this finishes off the first part of section 7.4.